It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. Welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to. Lots to talk about. I want to get to the economy. First, foremost, I agree with James Carville. It's the economy, stupid. Always, it's the economy, which is interesting in the latest polling that so many people think the economy is going in the wrong direction. The latest poll coming out um, saying that it's it's better than it's been. But um, oh, it's not great. Seven in ten still say that the economy is in poor shape, and half the country says that they're in a worse financial situation than they were a year ago. And I again, you know, greedflation, the the gouging that we're seeing at the pumps, at the cash registers. Thank you, corporate America. But this is one of these moments where you go, do you wonder why? People think that the economy's you know doing poorly because uh, when you talk to people individually, they're getting by, they're doing okay, you know, they're making cuts, they're doing what they got to do, they're making it. It's not that the economy's terrible. In fact, the numbers are actually moving us in a in a pretty good direction. I'll get to that in a minute. But our news media, our corporate controlled news media, who wants us always on edge, don't get too comfortable. Um. I think they got a lot to do with it. I look at the Wall Street Journal, the newspaper of the investor class. Headline, is the resilient job market about to crack? I look at Jamie Dimon, the the, the guru over at J.P. Morgan Chase, saying that, you know, that banking crisis, not over, and it's going to cause repercussions for years to come. In fact, in fact, he says that uh, a recession, recession, risks have increased because of, of all of this. It's all it's all bad. And we, we see this. Our news media is great at this. It's terrible. It's horrible. Things are bad. Be, be afraid. Be angry at whoever's in the White House. And look, the White House is doing... I got to tell you, I think they're doing a great job. Uh, the job numbers came out today. Another 236,000 jobs were added in the month of March. We now have unemployment at 3.5%. And here's the, here's the and my Republican friends will say, yes, but job participation. Yeah, yeah, participation rates are back to pre-pandemic levels. So now that argument's going away. And what's interesting to me is, that, you know, and this is what I love about Joe Biden. Uh, from Trump, we, we heard, you know, how wonderful he was. We heard it was infrastructure every week. There was always a shindig or a gala at the White House, him playing with trucks, him wearing funny looking hats, all kinds of stuff didn't do anything, had great rhetoric, had really good social media. Hey, look at me, wanted the spotlight, spoke glowingly about all the things that he thought he did. But we got a guy in the White House who doesn't speak very well, doesn't say very much, and is actually just doing the job. You know, there's more than 2.6 million, 12.6 million jobs have been created under his watch. Now, this is one of those, those little little factoids that I found quite entertaining. The fact that in just two two years and a couple of months under under Biden, he's now created more jobs than every Republican president of my lifetime. Uh, I mean, think about that. In just two years, He's created more jobs, 12.6 million jobs. Uh, the Clinton-Obama era, that 16-year era, 33.8 million jobs were created. And, and understand, you know, the Clinton years were, were, were good for a reason. What was that reason? Oh, yeah, we raised taxes on, on rich people. Uh, what's another little cute factoid before I get into the Biden numbers. Since 1988... And the end of the Cold War, the U.S. has seen 48 million new jobs created. 46 million of those 48 million 
were created under Democratic presidents. Let that just let that just swirl around. Because again, we're told that you know the Republicans are the, the party of business. And they are. They're the party of business because business profits have gone through the roof. We've done away with you know redundancies. We've crushed those pesky unions. Profits through the roof. Working people, you know, again, who need jobs, uh, they get screwed under Republican administrations time and time again. And somehow we, we, we seem to have a large number of working class folks going, I'm going to vote for them. It's really just quite remarkable to me. Now, as we said, you know, 12.6 million new jobs in the in the last 26 months, unemployment rate three and a three and a half percent. Uh, 236,000 jobs in the month of March. Uh, this is this is good. This is good news. This is moving us in in the in the right direction. This is moving us in in a direction of of creating opportunities for folks. Uh, you know, I remember remember during the Trump years, we all heard about how how low the black unemployment rate was. Well, record levels of black unemployment right now under under Joe Biden. So no more tr- Trump talking point. And as I said, labor participation rates are back highest level since the pandemic. Uh, GDP growth. We've done some, there's been some work done on inflation. Things are coming down. But here's the thing, and this is the part that gets me again. You know, I have people saying, you know, Rick, you know, why, you know, why you beat up on the Republicans so much? Other than the fact that Republicans hate working people, um, right now they're holding the country hostage. You're, this idea that we're not going to pay our bills is insane. Absolutely insane. Uh, they are holding the country hostage. Uh, and I think right now they truly do want to shoot the hostage. They truly, and that, that hostage is us, uh, but they truly do. And what we know is going to happen. If you don't raise the debt ceiling, if you don't do this, we're going to have, um, well, don't take it from me. Uh, take it from Mark Zandi. Uh, Mark Zandi is the the guy over at Moody's Analytics who has said, look, if Republicans don't allow the debt ceiling to be raised, uh, it's going to plunge us into the much wanted and wished for recession of the the Wall Street Journal and the Jamie Diamonds of the world. They're going to get their wet dream. It's going to happen. Also, it's going to cost seven million jobs, more than double the unemployment rate. And and what does that mean? That means you, me, and working people are going to suffer. Why? Because of their ideology. GDP is going to drop by 4%. The stock market is going to drop by 20%. It's going to wipe out you know, trillions in wealth. And seniors are going to get screwed. This is what Republicans are, this is what they want to do. And it's all because they want to stop spending. And this is the, one of those interesting kind of moments where you go, I have people tell me, well, Rick, don't you know, you know, the, the, our debt, our debt is huge, 30 some trillion dollars. And you go, yeah, it is. We should pay that back. We should start thinking about that. In fact, you know, I remember, I'm old enough to remember a moment in history Sometime around 1999, early 2000, where Alan Greenspan, the, the Fed chair at the time, said, we're going to be debt free and we don't know what to do when we're debt free because we've never done that before. What, what, what's the world going to look like? Rest assured, Alan, history brought us George W. Bush, who just blew that right out of the water. In fact, you look at the and I look at my lifetime. Reagan takes takes the Oval Office. We're about a trillion dollars in debt. And then we go on this tax cut fetish. We got to give more to the wealthy. We got to give more to big business. This idea of trickle down. And I'm sure you've heard of this. They sold it to us. It was going to be it was going to be heaven on earth. Manna from heaven was going to flow down. It was going to be rivers of gold and honey, and it was going to be beautiful. It's going to be amazing. Everyone was going to be a millionaire. Everyone's going to have the corner office. It was going to be great. We're going to get rid of all that, that New Deal stuff. We're going to crush those unions. It's going to be great. We're all going to be individuals, and we're all going to, we're all going to have the most toys. It's going to be fabulous because greed is good. And what did we do? Well, we created the largest billionaire class in the history of civilization. Yay, us. While simultaneously creating a massive debt. 
massive amounts of debt. And how did that happen? Well, you look at the Bush, you look at the Reagan tax cuts, massive tax cuts. You look at George H.W. Bush came into office and said, wow, this is bad. We've got to raise taxes. And he lost. Clinton raised taxes a little bit. And then, then the Bush years just crushed it. And we're moving in this direction where things are bad. Now, you know, again, I come back to this moment where I'm hoping that we're not going to get to the end of the road and Republicans aren't going to crush our economy, aren't going to hold us hostage and shoot the hostage on the other end. I'm hoping that this isn't that this isn't where we're going. But the sad reality is we're in a moment where if if Republicans get their way, if the wet dream happens, um, we're going to struggle for it and we're going to suffer for it. This is why, again, I, I come back to this moment. We have to decide which way we're going to go. Is it to continue the tax cut fetish and all the things that the GOP want to do? Or do we, we forge a different way? Uh, let's go to the phone. we got Joey on line one. Joey, how you doing? Hey, how are you, Rick? How you doing? I'm good. What's on your mind, brother? Great, brother. Yeah, I just got home from uh, organizing out in the field, organizing security offices at a local hospital. Outstanding. And, uh, good uh, on you, know, brother. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Yeah, organizing down here in Florida in the deep south. It's, it's the climate. It's not easy. Let me tell you, the anti-worker sentiment down here runs deep and has a long history. You know that from the early days of slavery all the way up to now, just labor rights and labor-friendly organizations have always looked down upon uh, down here in the Deep South. And I'd like to speak to you as uh, I like your idea uh, for the First Church of Collective Bargaining, so I'd like to, if I could anoint you as Pope <laughs> of the, the Church of Collective Bargaining. Uh, His Holiness uh, Rick Smith, Pastor Father Rick Smith, His Holiness. I like that. <laughs> No, it's so, something that we're actually yeah, trying to work on because I, I think I look. I, I I look at collective bargaining almost in the same kind of uh, kind of a faith based. You know, I believe in it. I believe wholeheartedly that's how we reunite this country. That's how we share prosperity. That's how we come back together as a nation. Uh, so I'm I'm all on board. Damn right, brother. Yeah, that's what we need. We got to come together. We need more solidarity. It starts early in the classrooms too. We got to encourage our brothers and sisters in the teachers unions to uh, start educating the youngest guys starting on elementary school about the history of the labor movement and what collective bargaining means and what unionization has done for this country over the years. And it's declined. What's that, what that has done to the country as well. So we've got to get our brothers and sisters uh, and the teachers' unions and the educators' unions to, to let the, the youth know about the, uh, the important history of collective bargaining and what it means. I'm and right uh, yeah, I just thank you. Oh, thanks, brother. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, thank you for your show and uh, Aaron uh, being a voice for labor. Uh, and, uh, yeah, man, we're just going to keep on fighting down here, down in Florida. As, as all the barriers they put up, we're just not going to stop. Me and my fellow labor activists, we're going to stay in the streets of Florida, and we're going to organize everybody from janitors to security officers all the way up to uh, college professors, and it goes on and on. So, again, uh, thank you for everything you do, brother. Have a good night. Thanks Solidarity. So much, Joey. Good stuff, Joey. Uh, and, th again, this is, how, this is how we do it. Uh, people getting into the streets, people doing the hard work like Joey's doing great, great stuff. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show dot com. I'm going to take a quick break. Back on the other side. I, I got to continue with this because it's 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 really bugging me. I, I right back after this. Stick around. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania to the auto factories of Michigan to the modern makers, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. The old factory towns in America's heartland have been taking a beating. Thing is though, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Unions are making a comeback. More organizing in the last couple of years than in a long time. And the Biden administration being more supportive of unions than any president since FDR. We're finally turning things around after 40 years of screwing over working people. 
But will we keep moving in the right direction? That's our choice as Americans. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. I want to spend a couple of seconds on this, this tax cut fetish thing. Because, you know, this has been, you know, all my life we've heard Republicans ask any Republican, what are they in favor of? Tax cuts. They all want tax cuts. Now, again, it doesn't really filter down to you and me, to working people. Um, but we pay for it. Oh, <laughs> do we pay for it. And again, we've created a sizable wealth class. And good on them. They've lobbied heavily. Uh, to get the power and the the, the money that, that, that they now enjoy. And there was a moment the other day when my wife and I were having a conversation that, that this kind of, all of this popped into my head. Um, real quick, we live in a township that, that just evidently uh, lost the, the, the contract to pick up our trash and a new, new, new carrier has come in. And this new col- trash collection company has basically doubled the rate. And, and stopped a number of practices that they, the, the previous company did uh, that allowed people to you know, only have trash pick up a couple of times a year or, or whatever for a much cheaper rate. This company is saying, no, everybody's in. And you know, the conversation went you know, kind of like, well, they're an older couple. They don't create much trash. And, and the neighbor's clearly angry because their rates are going to go from you know, a couple of bucks a year you know, up to... You know, I think it's going to go up to from 200 to 400 bucks a year now. So his rates are going to go from probably like 50 bucks a year up to 400. And he's, he's rightfully angry. Welcome to capitalism. And this is one of those moments where you go, um, this has been coming for a very long time. What we're seeing is welcome to late stage capitalism. The rates just doubled for no reason. You know, gas prices have gone up a little bit, labor costs a little bit, trash you know, dealings with a little bit, but not double. Not double. What this is is a good opportunity, greed, inflation, good opportunity to put money in their pockets. And you know, as as my wife said to me, they, you know, my our neighbor thinks you know there's some shenanigans. Somebody may have gotten a kickback, which may have been. And my mind went to the reality of what's happened. Just let's take this. Uh, I remember we lived in a place that privatized. The first year they privatized the trash. It was a hundred bucks a year to pick up. Well, by the time that contract ended, guess what happened? That rate doubled. Why? Because the township that we lived in at the time got rid of their garbage trucks, got rid of their 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 workers, got rid of all of the infrastructure to do anything on their own as part of the commons, as part of, of what we the people do for ourselves. And why did they do it? They did it so they didn't have to raise taxes, so that they didn't have to stand in front of the voters and go, um, you know, we, we had to raise your taxes to continue to pick up your trash. What they said is, well, we didn't we didn't raise your taxes. This is just a fee. It's a garbage fee. It's not a tax. But trying to explain to people that no, these are your these were taxes before. Your tax dollars paid for trash pickup. Now they've given you a bill from a private company. And of course it doubled. And you look at this and you go, of course it's going to double. Because this is what happens when greed takes over. Trash is part of the commons. Picking this up is good for society. It's not good to have free riders and not good to have people who are figuring out how to game the system. It's bad for, it's, this is a bad scenario. And I was saying, look, I remember when I first started working out of high school, I worked for a township, um, actually a small city, suburb of Cleveland, uh, Brooklyn, Ohio. And in Brooklyn, Ohio, at the time, they had a crew that showed up at, at 6.30 in the morning, and they went to your house, and they pulled your garbage cans from behind your house and put them out in front of your house. The crew that came in at 7.30, they went and they picked it up, took your trash away. Then they had another crew that came by later and put your garbage cans away. This was part of your tax dollars. Now, again, this is the 19, early 80s. This is when this happened. 
as we've gone to this, we've got to cut taxes, got to, got to cut, got to cut, got to cut, can't raise anyone's taxes. What then happened is, well, first they stopped putting the cans back. Then they stopped taking them out. And then they stopped picking it up because they got to privatize it. And now you're paying probably as much as you would have been paying for all of those services before to a for-profit company. Now, this little community, from its tax base, for seniors used to shovel their driveways in the winter. And in Cleveland, that's a big deal. And they used to cut grass in the summer. So if you were a senior citizen, you didn't, you didn't have to leave your home. And it didn't cost you anything because it was part of your taxes. And people didn't complain. People didn't go, well, I didn't get my grass cut. Why should granny across the street not pay? Because we were a different society. We were a society that still cared about the commons, still cared about our neighbors. Now I live in a township that we missed a bill. We missed two bills because our credit card got taken off of the, the automatic billing. The township sent me a letter threatening to foreclose on my house for a private company. This is where we've gone. And it's all because it all goes back to this, this Reagan era. We got to slash taxes, got to cut taxes. We got to give more taxes to the wealthy. And what's happened is, is we've tried to maintain the commons. We've tried to maintain educating our students. We've tried to maintain a military budget that's beyond, you know, the, what, the top 25 countries behind us. We tried to maintain ensuring that, that kids don't go to bed hungry or at least pretending like we're trying. And what have we done? We've ran up massive amounts of debt because we've been sold this idea. We've been sold this idea that that's all socialism. And it's crazy to me. Perfect example of something that drives, drives me just beyond nuts. You have a, a legislature, a Senate in North Dakota, who recently defeated a, a free school lunch program. Now, again, I grew up in the 70s lunch uh, you had school lunch programs in the summertime for, for people in, uh, all, across, all across the country. Reagan destroyed that. Here in, uh, in North Dakota, they voted against school lunch programs for kids. Uh, sorry, you low-income kids. You, you don't get it. But you know what they did? They voted an increase in the meal reimbursements for themselves. This is the world that this is the world that Republicans have brought us to. Hooray for me and the heck with everybody else, especially the poor, especially the working class, especially the people who actually get out there and do the jobs. So I look at this this moment. We've got choices as, as a country to be making in the near future. And a lot of them. Sadly, what we're focused on, and this is the just the bizarre thing to me, is we're we're focusing on who people love or or how they dress or 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 who they who they congregate with it's in, it's insane to me while we're literally being robbed blind at every turn by a political party hell bent on grabbing power for themselves and keeping the rest of us desperate the fact that republicans are are really willing to hold our nation and the globe hostage so that they could slash spending again without raising taxes, without doing any of the damage they've done in the past is just beyond me. So for me, I, again, I remember the past. I remember when we cared about our neighbors. I remember when we were part of, of, a, of a society and it wasn't just hooray for me and the heck with everybody else. Maybe we can get back there. Love to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Let's take a quick break. Right back after this. Calling all builders, all welders and roofers, engineers and electricians. Calling all brick masons and boiler makers, steel workers and steam fitters. Your country is calling you to rebuild America, to create a cleaner, safer, more prosperous future for all. Tackling climate change, this is the job of our lifetime. It's time to build back better. Let's get to work. I've been driving buses for five years and 
My day-to-day -day routine is I wake up a little earlier than most people. I get on a bus, I go out, I pick up some students and make sure they get to school nice and safe. Here in Fairbanks, Alaska, that can be a challenge because of the winter weather and the icy roads. But I love the job. So the Teamsters are great. They provide us a lot of protections. They've always taken care of their people, made sure that our jobs were secure. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we'd have a job from day to day. Uh, and that's amazing because before we'd be working four, six, eight hours a day and only earning minimum wage it was real difficult to make a living. And then the Teamsters pushed a lot. So we make something we can live off of and not have to have a second job. What absolutely gives me peace of mind. The, the union membership allows me to focus on this job without having to worry about whether or not my family is going to be taken care of. I'm Andrew Case and I'm proud to be Teamsters Local 959. It doesn't matter what kind of weather. It doesn't matter what time of day or night. When Mother Nature's done her worst, the only thing that matters to us is keeping the lights on for you. The hardworking women and men of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, dedicated to keeping the power on in communities all across the country. Because when bad weather strikes, we know what matters most. IBEW, the power professionals. Before we close the program, we want to take a moment to thank our viewers and to share a little bit about why we do what we do. At The Rick Smith Show, we believe that media today is almost entirely controlled by corporate greed. So we have now 24-hour news channels. But instead of 24 hours of news, what we get is one hour repeated 24 times and with, with tons of commercials creating obscene amounts of profits. Information once presented as a public service has now become a private commodity. So when lies make money, lies, lies are what we get. We get a corporate-controlled rage machine feeding us anger and hate, trying to convince us that our problems are right-left or red-blue, when they are and always have been up-down, the wealthiest 1% versus the rest of us. Our goal is is to be an alternative to that machine. Not as a news show with a fancy journalist out front, but as a talk show run by a union truck driver and a team of working class heroes just like you. Everything we do, both what we get right and what we get wrong, is dedicated to advancing the interests of America's working families. No corporate ad buys, no think tanks, no focus groups, no talking points. We are media by working people for working people. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you back here next time.